Turn with me over to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. The title of the message is Braggable Weakness. Braggable Weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Paul is writing. And he says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Verse 8. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Verse 10, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Lord, help us as we study your word today. Four things in this passage about which I'd like to discuss. One, insight seems to beget pain. Pain seems to be a prompt for entreaty. Entreaty is something that God hears, and then God responds by asking us what we're going to do with his answer. Paul was an amazing apostle, unlike any who have ever existed. I don't know how you compare the apostles in Jerusalem, James and John and Peter and Thaddeus and Nathaniel. I don't know how you compare them with one another and say one is greater than the other, but I do have my favorite, (laughs) and that unapologetically. Why? Because I patterned my life after how he built. He He was inclusive. He was the one who had the revelation about making sure that the Gentiles, people like us, me, who are not indigenously Jewish, could be grafted into this tree of life. And so I I love the fact that somebody actually wasn't made to reach me, but wanted to reach me. And so Paul's my favorite apostle. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, so I get a lot of insight about how to live well. Peter wrote some, James wrote some. James was not really one of the 12. He was a brother of Jesus, a different James than the James that was chosen by Jesus. But Peter wrote, and and, and, and that's good stuff. We can't get, don't want to get away from what Peter said in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Great stuff, but Paul, two-thirds. And I look at how he... How he, how he cared for the churches and, and his heart and his ability to reconcile and bring metaphors in that made sense to people who didn't understand what the will of God was and how he was able to bring his authority yet with comfort. The poetry of his leadership and authority is outstanding. And it ministers to my soul. And when I think about the things through which Paul went, I think, Lord, I love him, but I'm glad I don't have to live like him. I mean, he went through some stuff. You look at, 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 at 2 Corinthians 11 and, 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 and 2 Corinthians 4, stuff. I mean, betrayal by brethren. A day and a night out in the sea on a piece of driftwood. Beaten with rods. Taken with the, the, the Roman version of a cat of nine tails. And beaten with that with 39 lashes multiple times. Having no food, naked. And then upon that, he's got all the burden of the church on his soul. I definitely am not trying to envy his life. Though I do want to emulate his doctrine. And then when I think about the difficulties through which he went, I even get more distressed by this passage. Here's a man who went through more than any, any apostle in his day in terms of difficulty. And he, he asked God about this one thing. He wasn't ever asking. Listen, as, as, as difficult as Paul's life was, he never asked to be delivered from his difficulty. In fact, when he got, when he got baptized by Ananias in, in Acts chapter 9, 
the first thing, the prophetic word that Ananias was told by God to go tell him was this. It wasn't, I have a wonderful plan for your life. Come, be with me. I'm going to bless you. That was not even close. This is what God told Ananias to tell Paul, who was then Saul. Go tell him the things he is to suffer for me. That was his prophetic word at the beginning of his salvation. His entire life would be, would be marked by suffering. And so this is why whenever people would warn him about things that were going to occur in the city to which he was about to go, as in Acts chapter 20 and 21, when, when a man named Agabus said, I see the man who's going to Jerusalem bound it like this. And he took his belt off and bound his hands. And he said, terrible things are going to happen to that man when he goes. And he, he was referring to Paul. And all the, the, the people who heard Agabus' prophecy were there saying, Oh, thank God, the Lord has spoken. Paul's not going to go, yay! He has saved him with his word, God has. And Paul looks at Agabus and the rest of them, he says, All you've done is tune your dial to the station I'm on every day. The Holy Spirit tells me all the time that persecutions and difficulties await me in every city to which I go. It doesn't mean I don't go. Paul never asked to be delivered from his difficulty. He ran into it. But here, he asks God. He says, Lord, I got one, one thing that's really troubling me. And I don't know what to do with it, but it's, it's so burdensome to me that I can't deal with it on my own. I don't know how to fix this in my life. I don't know how to address it. And, and Paul says this, this thing called a thorn in the flesh came to him as a result of the revelations he received. Mm, you want insight from scripture? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Now, I don't think anybody's going to get as much insight as, as Paul got. I mean, it says in earlier, earlier verses in the same chapter, he was, I, don't, I know a man, and he doesn't even talk about himself in, in the first person. He doesn't say, I, Paul. He says, I just know a man. He talks about himself, if you will, in the third person. And he says he was taken up to a place that he was shared things with, things that were told him and things he saw that men are not permitted to speak about when they get back. Amazing insights. And I think he says, because he says 14 years ago, that that 14-year period was the period about which he was beginning to get the insight about incorporating the Gentiles into the grafting of God's salvation plan. I think that was it because no other apostle got it. Nobody was getting it like he was getting it. Now, God had tried to reveal it to Peter, and Peter got it, but he didn't make an outreach of it. He didn't make a mission of it. He just said, oh, God's doing this. He was taken to Cornelius' house after seeing what he saw in, in Acts chapter 10, taken to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius, who happened to be a Gentile, had his friends around him. He ministered the gospel to these friends in Cornelius. They got right with God in amazing ways. Holy Spirit fell upon them, but there was never another intentional outreach from Peter again to the Gentile community. It was just kind of an open door. And he said, oh, God cares for Gentiles. That's neat. And he went back to Jerusalem and did the same stuff he was always doing. Now, he did have theological conversations with the rest of the apostles. And they, be they began to develop doctrine about how to address the issue of the Gentiles and how to incorporate them. But there was no active outreach from Jerusalem. And so now God is saying, okay, I got my people who are the, the, the most responsible, the lead apostles in the world, at least sensitive to the idea I now have to get somebody who will intentionally go get him. And he finds this, this rogue leader of religion, Saul. Knocks him off his horse or donkey or whatever he was riding going to the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9. By the time we get to Acts chapter 13, he is now a full-fledged apostle, having been grabbed by Barnabas in the church at Antioch. And Antioch then says, we need to send these two, Paul and Barnabas, off 
to minister to the Gentile world. That is their job. And Antioch was this, this test tube. It was a Petri dish. It was the experiment on how in the world Jew and Gentile relate. And it worked. And as a result of them beginning to see how this happens, they were able to export that which worked at home. Home of Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas, later Paul and Silas, would go all over the world, taking a little bit of what was in Antioch with them wherever they went. And this revelation, I believe, at least, at least this was part of it, because some of the stuff he, he wasn't able to share. This part he was intentionally supposed to share. But this revelation has changed the world, the entire world. In fact, there are more Gentiles than there are Jews in the church. And, and, and the church is more characterized by Gentile participation than it is Jewish. And when we think about it, we hear of a Jewish person getting right with God, we go, oh, that's great, really? It's like a surprise, I'm so happy. But that's the way it started. Everybody was Jewish. That's how good Paul was. And a and that, in cooperation with all the other revelation he got, he said, because of the surpassing greatness of the insight that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So aside from the difficulty he had of, of going to every city and ministering this good truth and knowing that he was going to be beat, imprisoned, beaten, imprisoned, and, and not treated well, he said, there's something else that afflicts my soul. And I asked God, to deliver me from it because it was so uncomfortable. And when you, when you are Paul who is used to being beat and doesn't even ask God to deliver him from that, you know that whatever is afflicting his soul is really, really, really bad. And he says, God, please deliver me from this. And the man who had been taken up he doesn't know whether in the body or out of the body, have been taken up into heaven. By the way, I've never been there. Most of the people on the planet have never been there. You can probably count on one hand the people who have been there, which means you can look at, at, at Paul and say, special relationship between him and God. I mean, I know God. God knows me. He's called me in private times his friend, and I don't feel like I'm a very good one, but I love him. And I want to serve him with all of my heart and do his will. It's a privilege of my life to give mine for him. But I am not Paul. I'm not close. He's never taken me there. So he gets down. He has all this revelation. And he, he says, Lord, take it from me. And the Lord doesn't answer him. Now, there's a lot of times I ask God and he doesn't answer me. <laughs> A lot of times, more than I would like to admit. I don't, either he doesn't answer or I don't get the answer I want. And I, it's, it's, it's kind of it's embarrassingly normal. I'm just, I, I mean, I love him, but I, I, I'm still learning how to communicate best. He's whittled me down, and it's better than it used to be, but I surely am not all that I need to be. So it's kind of normal for me to not to hear what God is trying to communicate to me when I request things of him. And I have to reapproach him. But it doesn't seem to have been normal for Paul. Because he's able to count the number of times that he asked. As in, this is really unusual. I asked God and he didn't answer me. What's going on here? <laughs> I never asked that question. I'm, just, I'm sorry. I mean, I go back again, but I, I have to go back so many times I don't count. Because there are so many times. I lost count. Paul said I went three times. And finally he got a word. On the third. My grace. Is sufficient for you. For my strength is perfected in weakness. Listen. So much of this message is. Is going to now become a little autobiographical. None of us, especially me, can compare with the difficulty through which Paul went. 
But, but God uses a principle here that can be applied to every area of our life where we experience weakness to describe what Paul has to go through to find strength. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is perfected in weakness. That is a principle that we see coined here by the word of God, but is applicable to many other areas. And it was coined here because of the surpassing greatness of the insights that Paul had. And God said, I'm giving you this, this thorn in the flesh, to make sure you do not boast too much. Even in Paul, there was a leaning toward taking credit. And God said, I don't have time for you to battle with this. I don't want you to be in a position whereby people think something other than I really want them to think about you. That because you've gotten this insight that somehow you're better than them. That you should be the leader of Peter and James and John. You should be in charge of things. I want you to always act like you're the servant of all. And because I don't want you to struggle with the idea of how great you are with respect to the insight I've given you, I'm going to help you not struggle with that. And I'm going to give you, and it's called a messenger of Satan. Now, I've got some really <laughs> wonderful theology that doesn't allow me to continue to believe that, that a, 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 a demonic spirit is afflicting my life every day. That is normal, good theology. I'm saved. I believe the promises of God are mine. I've got a reservation in glory. I'm walking in favor. That when I walk through life, generally speaking, doors are going to open for me because God has paved and prepared the way for me to go through. That's the general way in which I live my life. It doesn't mean that I don't experience demonic onslaught. But I do not have a, a messenger of Satan that is tormenting me every day. I don't. And I want you to know, and God to know, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful. But this messenger of Satan was not going to leave him. This thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it was. We don't know. We don't think it was sickness and disease because he doesn't ever talk about being sick. He does talk about weakness, but he doesn't talk about sickness. It could be that there was, a, there was an, a, 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 a splinter in his brain from all the people that he had persecuted before he knew what it means to love God. And that may have plagued him all the days of his life. The mother that he separated from daughter and persecuted and confiscated homes and put people in prison. And now he was serving those same people that he had harmed. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He was the religious leader that gave the permission to stone Stephen, who was the first martyr in the church in Acts chapter 7. He was the guy at which the people who were lifting the stones laid their cloaks at his feet. Maybe those things were things that he just couldn't get over, and the enemy would continue to beat him up with that. I mean, what right do you have to even talk about this thing? You're with the... You're the one who tried to stamp it out. Shut up. You have no right to say anything good about who Jesus is. You tried to do everything to stop. Maybe the enemy was in his brain constantly every time he opened his mouth saying you are disqualified. I don't know. But whatever it was, it was so bad that he had to ask God three times and get the response that says, I'm not taking it away. Because it's going to bring humility in your life that's going to perfect strength that you would not have had otherwise and a kind of strength that will not be identified as being yours. As a result of, of this pain and the, the inquiry, God says to him, this is the answer. And then Paul gives an amazing response. He says, okay, well, most gladly then. <laughs> I don't know. First of all, I don't know how I would respond if something like that was continually plaguing my life. I know I'd serve God. That I believe. 
but I think there might be a little bit more complaint on the inside of me than is desirable, a little bit more dissatisfaction than anyone would want. I don't know that I would share it with a lot of people, but I would get with God on a regular basis and be like one of the psalmists who would say, fix this. Three times would not be enough for me to talk to God. It would be like three times every minute, <laughs> every day, every week. I just wouldn't stop. Please, God, please take this from me. I'd be knocking on the door until I tried to bust it down. That's Brett. But here, Paul says, most gladly, <laughs> which means I decided I would, I would not complain or have a bad attitude, but I would allow joy to be that which accompanies my difficulty. Joy seems to be the, 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 the ground, the wonderful soil in which things supernaturally begin to grow. I don't understand it, but I know that Joy is that which doesn't come simply because things are well. Joy comes supernaturally. It's a fruit of the spirit. It's not a fruit of circumstance. Happiness is a fruit of circumstance. Joy is a fruit of the spirit. You're happy when things happen to be going well. You're joyful even when they're not. And something happens on the inside of somebody when they experience joy when nothing about their circumstances says they should. And here, Paul says, most gladly then. This, this circumstance through which we're going with this pandemic has pressed me to the mat in my leadership. I have felt more weak than I have ever felt in my life. Now, I have felt weak before, but more so than ever. I found myself as a leader trying to manage loss rather than trying to figure out how to progress gain. Going through the pain of seeing the community in fear, people not being able to make eye contact in the grocery store, afraid to walk even close to you, and everybody battling, okay, I know it's the best thing we need to do because that's what the doctors say, but I feel rejected. I feel more lonely than I've ever felt. I feel that in the community, and I can't fix it. My best efforts can't fix it. I feel it in my church body. Folks that want to be together but are scared to be together. I don't even know what it's going to look like when they lift the restrictions. The restrictions are going to be lifted, but will it matter? I don't know whether people are coming back. I don't know. And I don't even fault them. Now, I have a different mindset about how I approach life. I'm very aggressive when it comes to looking at obstacles. I face them as best I know how head on, and I use my faith to try to overcome them. Everybody has their way of beginning to look at what this looks like and what normal begins to be. And I am not judgmental of anybody's approach. I want everybody safe. And I want you to live in the environment where your faith allows you to exist in peace. But I don't know what it looks like for us. Are we going to come in all with masks? Are we going to sit three, three seats apart from one another? Can we do one service and have everybody who will come, come? Or do we need to do six? And have 400 people in a 1,500 seat sanctuary on, on each of the six services? I don't know. Can we do children's ministry? I don't know. I feel as weak in my leadership as I, as, as I have ever felt. And I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to identify because I know you feel pretty helpless too. In your home, you don't know exactly what to do. You don't know how to be. You're trying to keep your family together, trying to keep them safe, trying to keep them encouraged and happy and healthy, trying, trying to keep your bride, if you're a husband, trying to make sure that she is secure. And, and, and I, I don't know about yours. But my Cynthia uh, is really big on washing your hands. And then and, and, and she's really big on making sure that the house is sanitary. She's got, she's got a Clorox little spray bottle in one hand and a towel in the other every place she goes. I mean, if you come out of the bathroom and you've washed your hands, it doesn't matter. If you come in the kitchen, you wash them again. <laughs> I ain't mad. I ain't mad. I get it. Hey, we're healthy. 
And so, but everybody has to figure out how in the world they're going to navigate through. I don't know. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out, God, what's next? What's next? And all of my efforts are not helping us get to where we need to be as, as I think where we need to be is where we need to be. There's nothing I can do. I feel like the disciples. When Jesus said, let's uh, go, go to the other side, he went up to pray. John the Baptist had just been, been beheaded. His buddy, his relative had just been beheaded. He went up to pray all night, sent the disciples ahead. <laughs> he said, I'm, basically, I'll meet you on the other side because there wasn't another boat. They were about halfway across the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee has a 33-mile circumference, so it's about 15 to 17 miles if you're going to walk halfway around. And Jesus said, it takes too long. You know, 15, 17, you know, that's, that's a long walk. That's all day. And it was the middle of the night now when he decided to try to join them. Instead of walking all the way around, he said, I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to walk on the water. Now, it says that the disciples at that time had been straining at the oars because the wind was contrary. And, and he had sent them while it was still a little daylight. It was evening. But by the time he got to them, it was the, the fourth watch of the night, which means between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. They had been on this sea for the better part of eight to nine hours, and they had only gone three miles. That's how bad the storm was. And they had lowered the sails and begun to row. And this is all the further they had gotten. I can't tell you how I feel what they felt. I've been rowing, and I feel like, I feel like I'm going up the down escalator. <laughs> going the wrong way on the movie walkway. I'm moving, but I ain't going no place. The proverbial treadmill. I, I feel weak, and in my strength, as best I know how, I can't get us to where we need to be. And rarely have I rejoiced in the moment. I, I haven't slept many times. No complaint. I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry. I'm just trying to identify with you a little bit. I haven't slept much. I pray a lot. Fasted a lot. And none of my efforts seem to help to get us where I think we need to be. And I have, to my shame, not applied the idea of most gladly. I haven't. I've been, I've been at a very low level of complaint. For which I repented when I realized the Holy Spirit wanted me to preach this message. Because joy is the seedbed for something supernatural. And so I've decided to let joy be the moniker over which this whole circumstance is labeled. Joy. I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow, but today I've got my God with me. You got your God with you. I have my dear friends with me back here. I got my family who's healthy. I got salvation. He's providing for me. Joy is going to fill my soul today and tomorrow and the next, even though the circumstances do not change. And when that happens, he says, most gladly then, I will, I will rejoice in my weakness, most gladly. I will take my weakness and I will combine it with the, the will of Almighty God so that I can address my difficulties best. He talks about five difficulties. He says weakness, insults, distresses, persecutions, and difficulties. Five categories that kind of encompass all the, the stuff through which he's going in his soul and the things that are coming at him from the outside. And, and the one I want to concentrate on most are two, really, distresses and difficulties, because this is not persecution. That we cannot meet is not persecution. It's inconvenience. If it were persecution, it would be directly leveled at the church and the world would be able to do whatever they needed to do. This isn't that. We're along with everything else that's going wrong. We can't meet. Now, I do believe that there is greater benefit 
and us being together, then there is liability. I think that. I know it to be true, and I will fight for that with all of my heart, yet without denying the, the compliance we all need to have to the restrictions. But theologically, there's something that drives me that says this is not normal. This is not right. Doing online stuff is a supplement. It is not to be a substitute. We need to be better in order to be best. We need to be together in order to do right best. That's what God wants. Hmm. But the difficulties and the distresses are things that we are going through. And, and they are general in their orientation. But it's difficult. Everything is difficult. And this is where we get to let our weaknesses show so that we can let God's strength be displayed. It doesn't mean we don't need to try. It just means that when we try in our faithfulness, he doesn't need our effort to do what he's going to do and probably won't use it. You still need to try to do right. It's good to always do right. But don't trust in your strength in order to bring about right. Because his strength is perfected in your inability. That's what I'm learning through this. One of the lessons. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would inspire you to come to the end of yourself. Try as hard as you can. Strain at the oars. Get there. Get there. Best you know how. And the end of the story in Matthew chapter 14 is this. Jesus was walking on the water. They see him. They think it's a ghost. Peter then says, can I walk too? Has his moment. Almost drowns. Jesus lifts him up, puts him back in the boat, and Jesus gets in the boat. And it says, and immediately they were at the shore. They had been straining all night and gotten halfway. But as soon as they invited Jesus and his strength into their boat, they arrived at their destination. Your weakness is the, is, the, is the atmosphere. It is the platform upon which God wants to magnify his strength so that everybody will know it was him and not you. God's going to do something great through this. Be the candidate. Qualify yourself by availing and understanding your strength is not that which is going to bring about the desired result. Manifest your weakness and let his strength be perfected in it. Let's pray. Daddy, I love you. I thank you for your goodness and grace and inspire us and help us to be the kind of people we ought to be. Please. We as a congregation, we come to the end. We're doing the best we can. But our best is not nearly as good as yours. And so we rejoice in our weaknesses. We most gladly will take our difficulties on and allow your strength to be that which is revealed. Have your way with your people, I pray. If there's anybody this morning who has yet to give their heart to Christ or maybe you've made a decision in the past but your life does not look anything like what a believer's ought to be if you fit in either of those categories raise your hand there just acknowledge in some significant way that you're interested in getting right and if you are pray this prayer with me say Father in heaven forgive me I am sorry for the way I've lived I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, we'd like you to do a couple of things. One, text new life to 25827 new life to 25827 somebody then will contact you and help you understand what it means to live this life with integrity and victory number two <clears throat> if you could go ahead and, and check the box in the chat 
that says, raise your hand, uh, that would let us know that you responded to the message today. And number three, if you'll go to the, the, the top of the box and, and look at connect with us in the chat, the Lord, is the Lord, we will contact you and that will put you in contact with one of our counselors and pastors that can help you right now by chatting with you. If you'll do that, I think you'll have the best chance of fulfilling the commitment you made. Bless you. We love you.